All right. Hello, everybody. Let me pull this down so I'm not looking up. We had a question that came in last night. And let me, while I'm at it, check the website to see if anybody else has left any questions. But Sean asked the question about, so why is that not coming up? That's weird. Sean asked the question about the jazz stuff that I teach. Oh, it says it's approved already. I don't even remember approving it. Okay. Sean asked about the jazz stuff that I teach. We have Tennessee tone etudes. We have um, the motifs, jazz motif. Uh, exercises and he wants to know if that falls under the 50 percent when we talk about the 50 percent rule we're talking about at least half of your practice time should be spent on music not exercises you know i've run into some problems with this 50 percent rule i call it the 50 percent rule because the children work well with that kind of language. It's not really a rule. It's a, a principle. But yes, the short answer to the question is those sorts of things fall under the music side, not the exercise side. And when we practice the routine, when we practice the lip slurs, when we practice that kind of stuff, that falls on the, the technical side. We and, and the reason I have this principle is because people get bogged down in the routine. And they spend way, way, way too much time doing the routine when they should be spending more time practicing music. So there are some gray areas, and, and it was right for Sean to point out this gray area. The, the tonalization studies, not the tonalization study, what am I saying? The, what do I call those? Tendency, tendency tone studies. The tendency tone studies are exercises. So in a way, you could say, well, those are exercises. Shouldn't they be in the exercise section? But these are exercises that are very specific for that song. Those tendency tone etudes and exercises are specifically meant to help you with a very specific chord progression. That is not what we mean when we talk about exercises being 50% or less. Okay? That's not what we mean. We're talking about your daily rudiments, your, your double-tonguing exercises, your triple-tonguing exercises. And one thing to point out how ambiguous this is, really. A lot of the stuff in the newer books is... They're basically musical etudes. When you look at the double tongue stuff and the triple tongue stuff in the Chops books, those are double and triple tongue etudes. Those are actual legitimate pieces of music. They're hard, but they're still pieces of music. That still falls under the category of exercises, even though the the, the double tongue etudes are more musical than the tendency tone etudes he's talking about. Let's dig into this 50% rule just a little bit. It was in the 90s when I began to understand what was wrong with people who only ever practiced exercises. 
And this is how I saw it. When, if you juggle uh, three balls, I know people, I can, I can do pretty good with three balls. You add a fourth ball, now you're, it's getting complicated. You add a fifth ball, now it's getting really, really complicated. Um, you compare that to playing trumpet. Playing trumpet is like juggling 50 balls at one time. It's the mental equivalent of juggling 50 balls. There are 50 aspects, 50 tasks that have to happen, mental tasks, physical tasks, that have to happen while you perform. Uh, so for so if we talk about posture, posture is one. Uh, air support, air support is another one. Articulation is another one. And articulation is just not... In fact, articulation can, can be broken down into separate ones, right? Because you have uh, the articulation style, you have the release of the note, you have the, the type of attack on the note, you have how, how much there's in the, in the uh, synthesizers, they have this ADSR, attack, delay, sustain, release. We have to do all that stuff in our mouth. We might not be consciously thinking about it, but all those things must be addressed by our subconscious mind. And there's so many of them. There's how, how should your arm be placed? What are the fingerings? How do you finger? There's people that finger like this, and we know that that's wrong. How should you hold the left hand? And that's before we even start talking about the musical stuff, about the rhythms. And when you add it all up, there's there's more than 50 things, because also we're going to look at, at ensemble stuff, right? Because most of the time we don't play by ourselves. So there are other things like intonation. We, we have our own intonation that we have to be concerned with. Then we have intonation in the context of working with other people. Now, what does all of this have to do with the 50% rule? An exercise, the point of an exercise is to, to push these ideas out of your head so that you're just focusing on one thing at a time. And that's good. That's valuable. That's why we do the exercises. Because without all of that as a distraction, we can focus on this and get this to be better. That's a good thing. However, people who only do that never practice balancing those 50 different things. It was in the 90s when I figured this out. People who only ever practice exercises have a tendency to not have this balance of all these multiple, multiple things that have to go on simultaneously. That's what the 50% rule is all about, is forcing us to play music. Every time we play music, it forces us to balance those 50 things. It's really 50 plus. There's more than 50 things. By the way, that's one of the reasons why I always stress that people should play in an ensemble. That's one of the reasons I uh, stress that this is one of the bad things about internet lessons, right? Internet lessons, you can't play duets with your teacher. I'm a big proponent for having duets with the teacher. Uh, the, what we can have, and this is part of the reason why I set it up on my YouTube channel, you can play my You Play First Chair videos. A lot of people forget about those. 
uh, and get the equivalent of that. But my point is, if you play in an ensemble, you're getting more of those 50 things. Okay? That's what we want, is a balance of focused without all that stuff in the way, focused on these rudiments so that we can hone in on what needs to be done. Then get that out of the way and go to that stuff where you're doing that, that balancing act, that, that uh, juggling act. It's a mental juggling act of many, many things going on at the same time in your head. If you don't practice that, you can't get good at it. The only exception I know of to what I'm saying here is if you have people like people, we don't see this so much today. But let's say, I think the closest thing we know to this today is maybe people in the major symphonies, maybe people in the military bands, but also the people that do like the true Broadway players, where they're playing two, maybe three shows a day, every day. When you have a performance schedule like that, that's obviously an exception to the 50% rule because you're playing music all the time. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing developmentally speaking. Because if you're that busy on the horn, yes, you're going to have things that help you progress and, and you're going to get good at certain things, but you're not going to have control over the direction you take. So let's say you are a Broadway player. Um, just practicing exercises during the day because you have all that time playing music in the evening is going to take away some of your uh, ver uh, horizontal mobility. If you want to ever get out of that, that scene, it's going to be a little bit more tough to do that. But anyway, so that's the only exception to the 50% rule is if you're just playing so much that you don't need that time on the horn playing music because you're doing it constantly all the time anyway. Um, but still, even with that exception, I think it's it's crazy to not it's crazy to not uh, keep that in mind. You have, like I said, you have less control over the direction you take if you're not focusing more on the music. Anyway, let's, hello, Javier. Nice to see you back here again. Hel, Javier says, hello, friends. I hope you are doing fine. Nice to see you. Yes, sir. We're doing great. Hello, Karen. Karen says, hi, y'all. I could never think about 50 things at once. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? Is It happens in our subconscious. Um that's how the body is, the human brain and the human body is designed. That's how the human mind is designed. We have layers of thought. Now, I, I had a, a teacher that told, not a teacher, a student that told me that I'm using the wrong word. It's not subconscious. I think he used the word pre-conscious or unconscious or something like that. Meaning that it's something that you're not thinking about, but it's actually occurring in your mind. Um, you could use the word mental. We have access to those things through proper training. So if there's something that you're doing wrong in your subconscious, you can do exercises that manipulate the way things are happening in that part of your brain. I said exercises. It doesn't necessarily need to be exercises. I just, for the Trumpet Chops Master Book, I just found an epith, uh, what, what do they call it? Um, epigraph. I just found an epigraph. It says, for every physical problem that exists, there is an exercise that can be assigned to the student that will correct the problem automatically. 
What do we mean by the word automatically in that context? We're talking about subconscious manipulation without his ever being aware that you were working on a particular problem. This is by Dennis Snyder. Um, I looked him up. He used to be, I think, now that I, I can't remember now, I think either Nebraska or Oklahoma or something like that. He was a, a trumpet professor. Um, and that's a quote from him. But it demonstrates, that's why I picked that quote for the epigraph is because it demonstrates how I see, we talked about this last week, how I see the usefulness of these routines. The routines don't change the conscious side of your thinking. They, they change the subconscious, just like what he's saying there. I discovered early, early on in the early 90s, I discovered that people don't need to understand the exercises for them to benefit them. You don't have to understand why the exercises in, are in or, that order before you benefit from exercises in that order. And that's what he's talking about. That's why I chose that quote. Javier says, Eddie, would you give some fundamental tips on flugelhorn playing? I have a flugelhorn, and it's similar to trumpet in some aspects, but completely different animal in others. Um, I just read a, a flugelhorn quote, and it said, I think it was a Clark Terry quote, and he said, a flugelhorn is like a woman. Let me grab that book real quick. It was kind of funny. This is a book called Famous Trumpet Players by Dr. Robert D. Weiss. This is by far one of my favorite trumpet books ever written. By far. Yes, here it is. Clark Terry says a flugelhorn is like a woman. It cannot be forced. It requires pampering. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll also share with you a quote. When I first started playing jazz at the college level, we had a, a tenor player that used to play with in, Chicago, in uh, Las Vegas with, he was in the band that backed up Elvis Presley. His name was, well, I shouldn't say was, he's still alive, uh, Danny Garcia. He came to UTEP when I was there to get a, a degree in flute playing. I think he was getting his master's. And he was the lead alto player in the jazz band and stuff like that. Great, great musician. I enjoyed working with him. But he was talking to me one day, and he says, Playing flugelhorn is sort of like sax players playing tenor. He says, if, if you play the tenor the, the way you play an alto, a lot of the expression is lost. He says, so if assuming that flugelhorn is the same in comparison to the trumpet, he says, you have to articulate more uh, clearly, you have to, what you are going to do, you need to exaggerate that just a little bit or it's lost on the people. It won't, that, that thing that you're doing to express yourself will be lost on the audience because it will become so subtle and so uh, imperceivable that it would make no difference to the people who are listening to you. Whereas on the trumpet, those things ring out very well. So now, my experience playing on the flugelhorn, you have to think of it as a different instrument. 
it's like speaking a different language. It really is. Not that I have all that much <laughs> experience speaking different languages, but the little bit that I have had, the, the occasions when I have had to, to um, and I've told you guys this story before, I don't believe that I've got very good Spanish. Um, I've got a very limited vocabulary and I have a lot of difficulty putting sentences together. But I had a gig for, I guess, about three months with a Cuban band and nobody in the band spoke English. And I was forced in that situation to speak as much Spanish as I was capable of. And I remember making a few mistakes. I get the words for church and library <laughs> mixed up sometimes. Um, um, not, not, no, it's not church and library. It, two of these words, and I remember specifically saying something to them, and I got the two words mixed up, and, and um, that was funny. But, but really, I, I, had, I had three months of rehearsals and performances with them where it was only Spanish the whole time, and I was able to com communicate. And I think playing flugelhorn is like that. It's, you, if you treat it like a trumpet, it's going to sound like a trumpet. And this thing about what, what, what Clark Terry says, I think this is significant. You know, another way of putting it is playing trumpet is more like riding a speedboat and playing flugelhorn is like more like driving a barge. You know, those big barges they have, they have to have like a, 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 a tugboat pushing them. Um, but when they move, they move sluggishly. And the flugelhorn is sort of like that. So I hope that helps. You know, it's all very abstract stuff that I'm saying. You can you can say that about a lot of things, and it doesn't really mean anything. But it's a nice way to think about stuff. Okay, Okie Doki says, uh, "Okie Doki Artichoke." <laughs> well, welcome to our Q and A. Do you have any tips to develop a solid embouchure to improve range wise? I play a tad bit to the right and develop a ton of problems playing above the C, above the staff, above the staff. All of my, well, I don't mind talking about it here, but I want to say outright that my chop building strategy is spelled out in my book called One Range. The subtitle is A Trumpet Chop Strategy Guide. One range talks about how I approach uh, not just building uh, range, but also building the embouchure and the, the, all that stuff. Um, now, the way you put this makes it sound like you are attributing the lack of a high C to uh, playing off to the right. And that's not necessarily the cause and effect. You say, I play a tad bit to the right and develop a ton of problems playing above the C, above the staff, okay? Um, those two might not be related. Maybe you're not playing far enough to the right. Uh, if you look at my mouthpiece placement, Look how far to the left line is. Look at how much lip I have there and how little lip I have here. This is so far off that the inside rim of the mouthpiece is directly at the center of my lip. That's how far off to the left I am. So now what are my tips for 
growing your chops. My tips are first the physical trumpet pyramid and what that is is a daily rudiment scheme that has you doing certain exercises in a certain order. It's a, a very similar to uh, Charles Reinhardt's stepping in drills. That's what I heard people call it. Uh, when the first time I shared my method with a ex Reinhardt student, that person said, oh, this is very similar to what Reinhardt teaches certain students. He doesn't teach all the students this, um, but certain students get his stepping in drills. I think that's what they called it, stepping in drills. And I figured out this stepping in drill approach on my own when I was cut off from anybody who would know anything about how to fix embouchures and stuff like that. So that's my first thing, as you do your exercises in a certain order. You start with lip buzz, then you do mouthpiece placement, then you do mouthpiece buzz, then you do long tones, then you do scales, and then you do lip slurs, and then you do articulation studies, and then you do uh, triple tongue. There's more to it than just that, but that's basically the, the, the basic layout of the exercises. That's the first thing, because that's going to encourage you to have by doing that order, it encourages you to have a proper setup. A and more, more be uh, a better way to put it is a natural setup. What's natural to you is what's proper. A lot of people will say uh, they're looking for the right embouchure. The right embouchure is your most natural embouchure, and it's possible your most natural embouchure could be entirely different from anybody you've ever met. The goal is to find what works best for you. So that's the first step. Then the second step is to go into this um, alternation of days. So you want to have days that you're pushing hard and then days that you're relaxing a little bit more. And I, I spell that out very clearly in the, in the book with precise schedules and stuff like that. Now they're hypothetical. You can use your own wisdom to modify them, but yes, it's all laid out in the one range book. Anyway, I hope that helps. A lot of people, when they ask that kind of question, they're, they're, a lot of times what they're asking for is, what can I do with my lips? What can I do with my cheeks? What can I do with my jaw um, to, to do better? And my appro approach to that stuff is not, especially in an all-text medium like this, there's no way anybody can tell you what to do with your mouth to make that go work better. The only time that's possible is when the two of you just happen to agree physically. And so when the guy tells you what works for him and you just happen to have the same characteristics as he does, and then that works for you, that's the only time that's even possible. Otherwise, it's like playing the lottery. So nobody can say, do this with your mouth, do this with your air, do this with the way you do this, and do this with the way you do that. It's also very personal that the chance that someone could tell you something that works for you is extremely rare. It doesn't happen. Javier says, that's a great quote from Clark Terry. I've noticed that I need to play more efficiently because it requires more air and is tougher in the high range. So I, can, so I can't force it because I gas out. But I love the instrument. It's such a beautiful instrument. I guess those flumpet type trumpets have the best of both worlds. Yeah, I guess you could say that. The problem with the flumpet is that it, it's... Because I have that, right? I have my other horn is very close to a flumpet in the way it sounds. 
Um, but you know, it, it has such a unique sound that it, that that it defies classification. And in that regard, it's hard for people. So flumpet. Karen is asking, what is a flumpet? Uh, flumpet is actually a, a instrument made for art farmer. And it's a hybrid of a flugelhorn and a trumpet. It's half trumpet, half flugelhorn. And it's made by Monet. This, so you can't have a flumpet that's not made by Monet because he invented the flumpet. And that's why Javier was being very specific. He said those, those flumpet type things, right? Flumpet type trumpets. Um, because technically you can't call what I have a flumpet because it's, it's not a flumpet. It's not Monet. It's not made out of, by Monet. So, Javier says, I love Art Farmer. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, I used to enjoy his playing a lot more than I do now. <laughs> I go through these stages with these different players. I, I listen to so much of his stuff for so long that I can now hear every tiny little imperfection. <laughs> so, which is a good thing, right? That's a very good thing. Every time you do that with a musician, someone that you like, every time you listen to somebody so much that you begin to hear their flaws, that means you have become a better trumpet player yourself. Javier says, imperfections make popular music interesting. Yeah. So, so yeah, I... Not too much imperfection, though. That's what... So, you know, it's... All of this stuff is relative. And I did it with some classical guys, too. There was a... I won't say names because this sounds like you're putting them down. And I don't like putting people down. Not until it counts. And... There's a, a classical guy that I was listening to his albums, and I think I mentioned this last week. You listen to it, and it sounds flawless. But the reason it sounds flawless is because you don't have that familiarity with that player and with that recording. The more you listen to it, the more you start hearing uncentered notes, the more you start hearing cracked notes, the more you start hearing a slight pitch imperfections and stuff like that. Uh, but that's because now you're closer to the, the product. Anyway, I hope that answers you guys' questions. Javier says, I love Bobby Shue playing flugel. I really dig Bobby Shue. It's so underrated compared to other famous trumpet players. Yeah. You know, there's a bunch of people like that. I got to play with Bobby Shue, I think, three times in my lifetime. The first two times were with universities. And then the last time was um, I was in a jazz band that did guest soloists for the um, jazz festival that we have down here. We, we had uh, a bunch of famous guys. We had, um, oh, now the names are, oh, Tom Harrell. We had Tom Harrell play with us one time. We had Barbie Shoe. There were a bunch of others. We did this for, for year after year. Um, it was a, a jazz band made up of Houston union musicians. And for most of those years, I was playing lead trumpet. Believe it or not, we had Dennis Dotson playing the jazz stuff. You guys will remember Dennis Dotson because I had him on one of these Q&As one time. Um, 
And then I was, for most of those gigs, I was playing first trumpet. <laughs> that seems like a lifetime away. <laughs> it's been so long since I've played lead trumpet on a, a big band gig lately. Um, not so much because I'm not playing that stuff anymore, but because those gigs have sort of kind of gone away. But anyway, yes, uh, the first time I played with Bobby Shue was when I was in college in the 80s. And he had us, he, he, I, I, my high school band director told us that when somebody asks you, do you want a solo, you always raise your hand. So he said, who wants to share, to trade fours with me? And I put my hand up. And, um, you know, there were people that night that said that they couldn't tell the difference between me and Bobby Shue. Of course, they were just complimenting me. Um, but that was... It was very nice. My point is it was very nice to be on stage splitting fours with him, splitting courses with him. I was a terrible, terrible player back then. The older I get, the more terrible I realize how I was back then. But, yeah, I like Bobby Shoes playing. My favorite song that he plays on, believe it or not, everyone, everyone likes his high note stuff. I like this song. a beautiful beautiful tune um, and when he plays it it sounds gorgeous yeah that's breakfast wine that's out of all the songs he's done that's my favorite hello Colin Colin says hey there Eddie stopping in just had a question about on how to take in more air when playing trumpet especially soloing it seems as if my sound is often airy, wondering if you had any advice. Um, how to take in more air. Now, let me tell you this. When you have an airy sound, normally that's going to be too much pressure. Okay? Now, How did I figure that out? Uh, I think I heard someone say that once, and then I did an experiment with it. Normally, it's because of too much pressure. Now, that's the direct reason. There's oftentimes an indirect reason for it. If you get tired, if you have fatigue, Oftentimes, you use more pressure because you can't get through whatever it is you're trying to get through without pushing a little harder. Then the airy sound kicks in. So if you want to get rid of the airy sound, the first thing you have to do is build the endurance so you don't get tired, so you don't have to push. Now, there are other things that can contribute to an airy sound. Getting enough air to come in is usually not related to that. So if your question is, how do I get rid of an airy sound? It has nothing to do with how much air you breathe in. So that's the first thing I would say. So basically what we're talking about is building your chops, building more endurance, 
And we've already mentioned the one range book in this Q&A. That's my approach to what you're talking about. You build better chops, you don't have to use pressure. If you do what I have in my one range book, if, if you do the things I lay out for you in the one range book, a lot of that will work itself out. Now, if not getting enough air is truly the question you're trying to ask, my answer to that is that you should be spending more time breathing deeply outside of the trumpet. I do not, I, I just finished reading, and this is after almost a whole year of doing research online first. I just finished reading two books about breathing, not trumpet breathing, just breathing. And they talk about this problem. So there's, def, there's like a epidemic in this modern age of people that breathe too shallowly. So that it is, I'm not saying that breathing uh, breathing deeply is is a bad objective. We do want to learn how to breathe more deeply. I'm just saying that that has nothing to do with having uh, an airy sound. Okay, so let's talk about breathing. What these both of these books point out is that people are breathing too fast. Oh, and here, let's, let's go to number one. Both books say the very first thing you have to do is start breathing through your nose 24-7. And I was actually able to pull that off before I bought the books. I've been, uh, in the past, I actually believed what these guys say in this book. I actually believed in the past that my nose was too stuffed up to be able to breathe through my nose. I used to be what they call a mouth breather, right? Someone that, that uh, instead of breathing through the nose, all the air is going in and out of the mouth, right? And I blamed it on allergies and a deviated septum. I have a deviated septum. And I thought, okay, my nose is just that way. Um, I'll never be able to breathe through it because of the allergies and the, the crooked cartilage. It ended up not being true. I forced myself to breathe through my mouth all the time. I'm even to the point now when I go to sleep at night. My mouth is shut and I'm breathing through my nose. That was the hardest part, by the way. That was the hardest part to change because when you're asleep, <laughs> how do you tell yourself, uh, keep your mouth shut? So that's the first thing I would say. If you're, if you're concerned about breathing, from this day forward, make an effort to only breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. Maybe you already do that. Second thing is to have a special time each day where you focus on breathing more slowly. If you breathe slowly, you can breathe deeply. Um, the, they say your goal should be to breathe four times a minute. And I surpassed that. Try this with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna set the the stopwatch, and basically you breathe in for 15 seconds, breathe out for 15 seconds. Now you can most of you won't be able to do this because you'll have to like warm up to it first, and then if you do that again, 15 seconds in, 15 seconds out, that's two breaths in one minute. Okay, let's, let's do that.
not out. Get ready to go back in. Now breathe in. Now block out. That was two breaths in one minute. If you are genuinely concerned about your breathing on the instrument, start doing stuff like that. Now, if you can't, if you can't do two, min two breaths in one minute, now, the way you work yourself up to that is with that, what they call box breathing. I cannot believe I'm actually teaching this in the context of trumpet because I remember people talking about box breathing and I'm thinking that's that's nothing to do with trumpet. Well, actually nowadays I actually think it's related to trumpet. I have been wrong in my lifetime. <laughs> and I'm not afraid. This is this is why I'm so what well, what would the word be? Uh, uh, the word that comes to mind is powerful. But that sounds arrogant, capable maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm not afraid to be wrong. And I do believe that creates a powerful mindset. If you're not afraid to be wrong, that means you're constantly learning. And someone who's constantly learning is going to be more right than he is wrong over the long period. Someone who's afraid to be wrong is going to stick to what they're doing wrong and not change. So I'm not afraid to be wrong. That's how you figure out when you are wrong. So if you can't do two breaths in a minute, then what you do is you start with the box breathing. What is box breathing? Box breathing is when you breathe in for, they say four beats, right? Four counts in, then hold your breath for four, then out for four, then hold that for four, then in for four. That's box breathing. Now, what I do to get to where I can go to two breaths per minute is I expand that instead of doing in for four i do in for eight and then i hold for eight then i do out for eight and then i hold for eight uh, essentially it's the same thing as breathing two times a minute it's just a way to i use it as a warm-up for breathing but yes i've been working on the breathing now, the thing is, is, if you can slow your breathing down, if you have enough control to slow your breathing down like that, you have the same control it takes then to breathe more deeply. And then the one book I read said there was also a problem with people who don't use up enough of the air that's already in their lungs. So you can do that. You can take a, a phrase, maybe a Clark study or something, and play it until you run out of air. Pushing all the way through. And you have to, when you do that, you have to, to fight against that natural reaction that says, oh, I need to take a breath. You know, the, the suffocation. You have to fight against the natural response that says it's time to breathe. You have to fight against that. 
and in the process you push farther and farther and farther using up more of the the air that's in your lungs now why is that important for us as trumpet players that's important because we use different muscles to support from that part we don't it's not the same musculature when your lungs are full as it is when your lungs are empty it's not the same that's like saying if you're arm wrestling somebody that it's the same musculature here as it is here. That's entirely different musculature. Does that make sense? What muscles have to flex or how much they have to flex in that position is different from this position. And it's the same thing but on a more complicated scale happening inside the core. When, you're, when your lungs are closer to empty, the position that the muscles are in, if you want to push enough to get pressure out the lips, the muscles that you have to push to do that are in a different spot and, they, and they feel different. You're like on a different part of the muscle. You know, it's sort of like people who do curls, right? And you see these guys, they'll do curls like this. And then they have like this little bulge. <laughs> you can tell. You know, my I grew up with brothers that would that would extend all the way out for the curl, right? All the way down, all the way up, all the way down, all the way up. And they had arms like this. It wasn't it wasn't cut. But the, you know, here's the difference. They weren't doing it for the looks. They were doing it for the strength. And the technique you use to make it look a certain way is not the same technique you will use if you want absolute strength. And it's the same thing, right? You, you're doing pull-ups. You see people who do pull-ups like this. Okay? As opposed to all the way down, all the way up, all the way down, all the way up. You're using the whole muscle uh, 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 spectrum, right? All of the muscles are being used all the way when you exercise like that. And the same thing, precisely the same thing is true with the breathing. If you only play to being half full and then breathe again and then half and then breathe, you never work those muscles at that position. So I think, I, I truly believe that pushing the phrasing as far as you can push it on a regular basis is an important part. Now, I also have this other belief that one of the best ways to have a solid upper register is to do this long breathing stuff that I'm talking about. I don't mean off the horn. I mean on the horn, where you're playing something like the Clark studies. Right, going on and on and on, over and over and over again, until you run out of air, and then you go... And and you're at the end of your ear. <laughs> like almost nothing's coming out. <laughs> right? Um, that's so good for the, 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 the support. The muscles that you're building by pushing through that are muscles that will kick in when you're trying to play in the upper register. That's a long answer to that question. <laughs> I just screwed up on the Clark study, didn't I? That's embarrassing. Um, any other questions?
We're almost out of time. I'm going to make today shoe fly pie. I'm our our church is having on Sunday a chili cook-off, and then they also had another section that you could sign up for to bring dessert. And I put our name down for dessert, and then I signed up for the chili cook-off. Um, they have the chili cook-off right now because the ra rodeo is going on. This is the, the rodeo is one of the biggest events in Houston every year. And they have a chili cook-off at the rodeo, so now we're having chili cook-off at our church. And I'm going to enter. And then I'm making shoe fly pie. Huh? I hope you guys know what a shoe fly pie is. It's S-H-O-O-F-L-Y. Shoe fly pie. Um, I think a more like culinary word for it is um, molasses crumble pie. I think that's the technical term for it. But we call it, from Pennsylvania Dutch, we call it shoe fly pie. Um, I'm making three of those. I've already offered to give one of my students one of them. <laughs> so, if you're thinking you might want one, if you want one, you have to come to the church. And then um, I have a, a chili recipe that I made up in the 90s. Never went to a chili cook-off before, so I don't know if people are going to like this or not, but I like it. I have a very unique recipe that that I made up. Colin says, haha, it was long, but a well done answer. Well, thank you. All right, we've got a couple minutes left. Any last questions? You know, I had, I want to tell you guys, I had a student, I mean, not a student, a, um, a potential student, he sends a, a, a thing on my form on the website, and he says, please get back with me, um, and tells me his situation and all that stuff. But he put the wrong address in the thing, and I've been looking for him on social media. I've been looking for him on – he said he was an older gentleman, so um, maybe he's one of those guys that doesn't do social media. And I'm only mentioning it now in case he might be watching this. But, you know, if you use my form and you want to hear back from me, you might want to make sure that you've got the right address on the form. Because that's, I, I, I can't get, I, the, the email bounced right away. I don't know why I thought about that now. I should have thought about it at the beginning of the left, uh, the at the beginning of the Q and A. All right, one minute. Any questions? Last minute questions. Otherwise, we'll call it quits for today. It's always great to see you guys. I'm looking forward to doing some some baking, making a shoe fly pie. This recipe makes three pies. Um, last time I made a pie for an event like this down here in the south, I labeled it as a shoe fly pie. Um, I spelt it S-H-E-W and then a separate word F-L-Y. And nobody touched it. It's not the prettiest looking pie. In fact, it's it's just a brown thing. It's a molasses pie, so it's brown. It, it doesn't have frosting or anything like that. So it's not visually appealing. But I think the name puts people off. They associate it with flies. But that's the point. Is it's supposed to be so sweet that you have to shoot the flies off of it. That's why they call it shoe fly pie. It's supposed to be so sweet that you have to shoo the flies off. Um, but somehow people can't get, like, disassociate the flies from the pie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so 
They call these desperation pies. I just found that out recently. A desperation pie is something you can make with whatever's in your pantry. Anyway, that doesn't have anything to do with trumpet, but that's what I'm doing right now as soon as I get off of here. So, all right. God bless you guys. Thanks for hanging out. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time. Have a great weekend. Bye.